There is great need of discernment, and there needs to be great hesitation and running around saying this is demonic and this is not demonic. The Lord was able to make that clear distinction because he was given the spirit without measure. And more can be said about identifying demonic activity. But I want to use this time to explain something that is crucially important because this verse that I just read to you is often used by those who would believe that it is possible for Christian believers who are filled with the Spirit to be at the same time possessed by a demon. That not might be something that you are familiar with in your network, but I must say that among millennials, this is a growing trend. It is becoming increasingly popular where you are having people claim and believe that Christians can be possessed by demons and then make up their entire ministry called deliverance ministry doing deliverances on people who are apparently child, a child of God or children of God. And what they would say with a verse like this is, well, you see, you see a man who was in the synagogue, a place of worship, and because this man was a regular attendee in a place of worship who had a demon, what well, makes us not believe that somebody who comes to a regular church service can be possessed with a demon? Now, there's so many problems with that. Inter- it might sound clever, but it is extremely problematic and severely overly simplistic. You can't just come to a verse like this and say, well, there was somebody in a synagogue who had a demon, so people in church who are Christians can have demons. First of all, you and I know this. Who says that you coming to church means that you're an actually child of God? We can just end the argument right there. Just because somebody's regularly attending a service does not mean automatically we don't presume that they belong to Christ. So to make the conclusion that somebody was sitting physically in a religious service means that they are in right status with God is already an argument that defeats the whole thing. What we have to understand if this teaches anything is that you can have people who regularly attend a church service who are demonized and unsaved. That's how we interpret it. And they might go on to say that, well, you see many instances of the New Testament where people who are followers of Christ are clearly possessed by a devil, and so they will use scriptures like with Jesus rebuking Peter when Peter tried to rebuke him about going to the cross. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You see, here's Peter that in a moment Satan entered him and influenced him and spoke through him to speak to Jesus and try to divert him from the cross. And then they would go on to say, well, that's even seen in the book of Acts where you see Ananias and Sapphira. They come into the church and they lie about their giving And Peter looks at this couple and says, or rather the man first, how has Satan, why do you allow Satan to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, to lie to God? You see, Satan filled this churchgoer, this Christian, this follower of Christ, filled his heart. And so it's possible for Satan to enter into a Christian and then perform his will through the Christian. And I just have one simple question with both of those instances and many other instances that they would use in the Scripture. If that was the case, then why didn't Jesus cast the devil out of Peter? And if that was the case, why didn't Peter cast the devil out of Ananias? No, what you see there in both of those instances is that the evil one influenced their thinking. And even with Peter, Jesus, I'm paraphrasing, looks at him and says, your mind is on the things of man and not the things of God. And in Ananias' case, We all believe that it is possible for evil spirits to influence us, to tempt us, to to suggest things in us. But we are not among those who believe that a demon can come and have direct influence over your behavior and your speech. There's so many arguments. We can spend the rest of the service debunking these things. But let me give you one simple, I believe, final verse that would close this argument. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 and 2. What you see in this portion of Scripture is Paul addressing the glorious rescue in Jesus Christ. He's telling these Christians who you were before Christ, the things that you were caught up in before Christ, and who you are now because of Christ, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. But let me read to you the first two verses. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. There are many 
explanations for what this means. But one thing I know in the wider context is that the spirit, the prince of the power of the air, only has access to various degrees in those who are outside of Christ. Those who are outside of Christ, as they, whether knowingly or unknowingly, follow Satan and are guided by Satan through sin and the deceptions of this world, open themselves up to his influence in their lives to various degrees. And depending upon the severity of a sin or the invitation of a person for the demonic, that can even include demonic possession. You have those who are messing up with the occult, those who are messing up with certain drugs and these different kind of activities that open themselves up for Satan to have access to them in very powerful ways. But that is a threat. That is a danger for those who are outside of Christ. When Jesus rescues you and I, he fills us and he seals us with the Holy Spirit. And part of that is that we are protected from ownership from Satan. And this is an extremely important truth because I want to tell you the fruit of this teaching among many who are in my age bracket. And there are some who are older who believe this too. Deliverance has been replacing repentance. What do I mean by that? Now what you're having is a demon for every sin. So if I struggle with pornography, it's a spirit of lust. If I have a habit of lying, it's a spirit of deception. If I have a gambling issue, it's a spirit of greed. And so every sin pattern now has a demon behind it. And what you have people doing is lining up to these kind of ministers, asking to be delivered from particular sins, when in the Bible, Jesus doesn't say, get the devil out of you. He says, repent. So do you see how this is very, very tricky? What you're having now is people who not only receive one form of deliverance, they come for constant deliverance. Because these same people who say that you have a demon in you will also say you need multiple sessions to be delivered. Which is fascinating to me because when you explore those who hold to this view of deliverance, they would argue Jesus delivered, Jesus had a deliverance ministry, and so Christians must also, and I believe that there are demons, and I believe that demons can be cast out today because it is biblical. But what I'm trying to say is those who say that we have to do deliverance because Jesus did deliverance, don't do deliverance the way Jesus did deliverance. 